Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> um, this week's discussion uh, is going to be uh, a little different. In, in as much as I don't have a huge presentation per se compared to some of the other uh, ones that I've done, mostly because we will be in part uh, taking a bit of a look at what's yet to come. Um, and, and I also want to be sure to hopefully have some time at the end for some questions. Um, because when I was talking to Munchin Sensei about the topic um, and the dis discussion topic for this month, uh, he said yes to my idea, and that's a, that's great. Except you should do it for the whole year. So, <laughs> welcome to the first of many discussions. Um, uh, so, uh, what one Wednesday a month? Uh, I'll be uh, taking a particular aspect of East Asian Buddhism. Um, and whether that's a particular school or sutra. Um, and I don't mean this to be an intro class uh, that you might see at a, um, in a college curriculum, although obviously the title for tonight's discussion uh, might have been purposefully misleading. Okay. Um, I see this more as a way to look at some of the major sutras, uh, theories, and schools uh, piece by piece, building into a more cohesive understanding of Buddhism and Tendai within East Asia. Even um, though each one of these topics could be an entire semester's course in and of themselves. Um, but as a backdrop, I, I've been trying to be really purposeful in the words that I use in these presentations. And I may sometimes talk about a particular sutra or a certain school of thought. Um, and to some, if not many, uh, or at least a few here or, or online, uh, they may have little to no context for what those terms represent. Others have been here a long time, or at least come with their own amount of experience and knowledge, um, and may have a better understanding of some of those distinctions, some of those terms. And to those of you here for that, uh, I am sorry. <laughs> um, some of these discussions may not be as fruitful for you, but hopefully, right? Hopefully they are, um, at least in a new perspective. Um, please. So through the discussions, um, my goal is to try to place Tiantai and Tendai teachings within the greater sphere of what we think of as East Asian Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, and even Buddhism on the whole. Um, how can we better understand the formation of schools like these? How does a school like Tendai interpret its own place? within the whole. And obviously, as a Tendai priest, I have a very biased perspective. <laughs> um, I assume that a few of you might have a little bias as well. I mean, we, we can't not use our Tendai perspective. So since we're here talking about it um, as a Tendai group, I want to use the Tendai perspective to, in fact, bring more meaning into these discussions always trying to relate it back to those Tendai teachings. This is not intended to be a history lesson or a Buddhology course. I am not um, <laughs> in, Instead, my perspective is if, we're, if we are to practice Tendai, we should probably know a little bit about the branch of the tree, if not the tree itself. My argument is that by getting to know more of the tree or the branch, we can at least better understand our little stick of it. <clears throat> the exploring of these subjects help us have a better grasp uh, of a path that we can trust, a, a perspective we can nurture, and, and a grounding in what we practice. For example, Tendai is a <coughs> Lotus Sutra school, um, not uh, at the exclusion of everything else, but uh, uh, actually quite inclusive, and but using the Lotus Sutra as the primary doctrinal text. One of the major developments that the Lotus Sutra brought to Mahayana thought was that of upaya, and skillful means. It, it is the skillful means of Shakyamuni Buddha that in giving teachings that continue to teach, and teach based on the capacity of the person or group. This helps to establish the Ekiyana concept, the one vehicle, meaning that the teachings of the Arhats, the disciples, the Pratyeka Buddhas, or the solitary, the solitary Buddhas that came slightly after, 
and then the bodhisattva path towards full um, Buddhahood were all just ways of bringing people to the one Buddha vehicle. I might interject here that this was in response to early Nikaya teachings and so was trying to, uh, to separate out uh, from the Buddha, Buddhahood ideal, yet still lending credence to those earlier teachings. The Lotus Sutra is fascinating. I mean, we'll get into that. That's a whole other discussion. Um, but <clears throat> if I could run with the idea a bit, and, and if we take this Ekiyana perspective, rather than contrast Tendai to other schools, we compare. Or we simply explain with no pretense or judgment. We're not pitting one versus the other, and there are no lines for, because there are no lines for those distinctions. All the teachings are meant to be expedient devices, manifestations of upaya, skillful means, all meant to alleviate dukkha, our discontentedness. How does that help instruct our own perspective of various practices? Devotion, uh, other points of view, even, etc. What can we learn from how the Dharma manifests over vast amounts of time? How do the, how does the Dharma manifest over vast geographical areas through vastly different cultural paradigms? Hopefully, we'll find out. <laughs> um, all through that process, I want to bring a better understanding of how Tendai teachings fit into this greater whole of the Buddha Dharma. So, with that said, I have to say there, there is a consideration that, I, um, that we should keep in mind in talking about this um, and for tonight's discussion and, and uh, in future discussions. In, in this looking back in time, we often uh, attribute characteristics and distinctions upon a time a place, a people, um, and as a, it, all as a way to help develop a, a little bit of a context. And we will always use terms to define phenomena. But please bear in mind the, the fluidity of what we're trying to talk about. Um, <clears throat> we may define a group of people. We may define a group of people, but that doesn't that does not imply that there's a rigid boundary between that group and another. For example, we may talk about how the Mahasamgikas were a group of early Buddhists that we may attribute to be a precursor Mahayanist, although there are some other theories about that as well, but that doesn't mean that they define themselves that way, nor would they have considered what they were practicing, what they were practicing would be possibly become what might later be defined as a major Buddhist schism in a long, gradual development of Mahayanist ideals. They weren't of that mindset. Um, those people were practicing what they had learned and were following what made sense to them. It's only us that only look back and see that overall trend and label that. These categories and groupings are helpful, heuristically, obviously, but they too can strictly confine what would otherwise be a very fluid concept. Maybe more fluid than we might be comfortable with. And we don't really do well with ambiguity. And therefore, this grouping can attract an us versus them mentality, or at least this group versus that group. That teaching versus this teaching. And that can detract from an understanding that the Dharma is forever being interpreted practiced and embodied. And so what we may see as a progressive evolution through distinct periods of time or through various schools and teachings is instead itself a manifestation of the Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings, ever skillfully providing that supportive raft to the other shore. And here we are in this time and place looking back at that time and place, trying to learn. <laughs> so for the sake of our heuristic tendencies, yeah, yeah, we're obviously gonna be using um, distinctions, groupings, categories, there'll be plenty of naming of things, timelining of things. Um, I just ask that we keep all this in mind because I hope that to be a, a general 
theme in these discussions that like, as we work to understand, how can we start to blur those lines at least? Okay, so with all that kind of explanatory note out of the way, um, where does that leave us? The introduction to East Asian Buddhism. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so, where to begin? I thought that was the introduction. That was, yep, that was supposedly the introduction to the introduction. Um, no, I mean, we should probably start at the start. Um, but I don't, you know, that's, how do we define what that is? Um, are we talking about East Asian Buddhism and, and what are the, and the countries involved in that? Um, would, would that be, the, would the start of East Asian Buddhism be the introduction of Buddhism to China? Is that when it's first arrived? Or is that when it's formally accepted? I mean, right away we kind of see a, an issue of what I was just talking about in terms of how we define things. Because what is East Asian Buddhism? Buddhism that comes from East Asia. That's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> so. I wasn't going to answer it. Um, <laughs> so instead, for the sake of our future discussions, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be painting some really broad strokes here, folks. Um, please be patient with my generalizations. Um, but in somehow we have to introduce this um, introduce so to, to, to East Asia. Um, so uh, bring your flexible minds as we dive into some gross simplifications. Um, I, I at least got to get this ship floating and, and on the right track. So, um, slide please. So for today, um, we are not going to be talking about the development of the Mahayana, um, because that would be a whole year's worth of discussions. Um, but in fact, much of what was being exported to China and what China was importing was what we might consider, consider early Mahayana's thought. But Buddhism's had been brought to China since the second century BC. Um, but what was only, for, uh, only formally adopted um, around the onset of the Common Era. And it would have been um, coming from uh, the Gandhara area, which uh, is now um, northern Pakistan, uh, eastern Afghanistan, and Tajikistan. Um, so the kind of edge of the um, end of the Himalayas. Um, and but it was really being housed and flourished in the Gandhara uh, region. Um, then along the Silk Road, which bridged Central Asia and all points northwest to, uh, uh, to more eastern China. Um, so the, the Silk Road was coming from the, the west through in East Asia and into eastern China through the western tips of the Himalayas. So around um, and around the... Um, the Malacan Desert, which, um, if you see on the, is just below the, um, the light blue, uh, the light purple area there. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and so Buddhism's prominence in Central Asia and then the expansion turning eastward was timely. Again, China would have been exposed to Buddhism for several hundred years before, um, before it was formally accepted. I say formally accepted. I mean, it, it was... Um, it was being um, within the courts imported. So I can't say that they, were, they, weren't, um, they weren't converting, per se, or leading with Buddhism as, a, as the law. That was much more Taoism at the time, um, uh, but at least accepting those teachings. Um, and so it would have been exposed in the early Han, but, but kind of later accepted again we wanted to term that in the in the later Han dynasty, which would have been again the, the turn of the common era. So we and by then we already have um, texts being translated into Chinese and being distributed around and, and being distributed meaning again within the courts. They might have been imperial gifts um, from one territory to another, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there were also um, uh, missionaries. Um, Coming up and traveling into that, into China, um, but Buddhism immediately had to contend with Taoist notions already embedded within um, the Chinese perspective. Wang Xin Sensei just did a whole conversation about this um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and it just went up on YouTube. If anyone's interested, um, go check it out. Not right now, 
Um, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, it, it, it makes sense that then it wasn't for another three to five hundred years after Chinese Buddhism really flourished. Chinese Buddhism, right? Buddhism that was kind of self-developing. Um, uh, and that and and taking a more uh, stronger foothold culturally in that area. Slide, please. <clears throat> so, what were those Buddhisms that were first being introduced? Um, again, for simplicity's sake, we'll we'll call what was entering China Gandharan Buddhism, Buddhisms. Um, which was made up of numerous, mostly schismatic schools, pre-Mahayana uh, thought schools. And, and so you see some uh, of the characteristics of what we now see as Mahayana's teachings starting to take shape within these groups, despite the continued reliance upon the Vinaya, the moral code of conduct or discipline. So these groups may have all adhered to various, uh, various Vinaya, they may have had small um, changes, but what they were studying and what they were practicing may have been very different. <clears throat> um, again, for the for a whole host of reasons that I would love to get into because it's absolutely fascinating, um, but I won't because of simplicity's sake. These new interpretations were only just growing within the various communities over vast time. Um, what I can say is that generally. The characteristics of many of the Buddhisms being brought to China at that time were on a varying sliding scale for any of these themes that you see here. Again, as much as I say that it was pre-Mahayana's thought, there were many differences from practitioner to practitioner, place to place, area to area. But the overall trend was changing within, this, uh, within several of these general themes. Now, this list is not exhaustive at all, by any means, but this may help to understand that during this time, any one group may have emphasized one point or another, and could therefore be anywhere along that gray spectrum um, between what was traditionally held, those uh, elements on the left, um, <clears throat> and, what was going, uh, and what was going to happen moving forward over time, as we see on the right. Those things on the right uh, are the things that start to define the developments of what would, what would become the Mahayana. These changes were gradual and certainly not universal. Again, generally, these later northern groups were moving away from rigid scholastic analysis and classifications and trying to explore the underlying meaning or spirit of the teachings. This, in and of itself, is a huge shift in thinking because it implied the Dharma could change. Think about that. That would be a huge <coughs> leap and would have fundamentally changed the perspective of traditionalism to visionary. And in fact, that's what Musong kind of describes as a main distinction between the two. Um, is that right, Sensei? Is visionary and... Uh, no, no, he, he calls the uh, Hirakiyana uh, psychological. Psychological, yes. And he calls the, the Bodhisattva Yana visionary. Visionary, that's right. Thank you. Um, monasteries, uh, uh, the next point there, monasteries, um, they were, uh, further west, they were less prominent. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that the schools admonished mon monasticism. Um, in fact, many uh, strictly adhered to it. But I'm sure that it's hard for missionaries to spread Buddhism along the Silk Road if monastery Buddhism is the focus. And so much of the teachings started to be geared to attract laity, with a new emphasis on living as a bodhisattva, much as Shakyamuni did in the previous lives leading to his Godzilla mm -hmm. life and awakening. There are arguments that this, that this bodhisattva notion could have been the major factor in Mahayana development. Reflecting on, reflecting on stories of the Buddha's lives before his life as Gautama, like those found in the Chitaka tales, the, the idea of a bodhisattva path was taking shape. And this could speak to monas monastics and laity alike. 
we could all live in a way that tried to mimic the accomplishments and practice the perfections of Shakyamuni Buddha. It was through action, not simply study, that us common people um, could start to practice the Dharma and gain merit in other ways. Um, what, and we should probably, we all know that this really only, again, benefited the elites, those who had time to study and practice, etc. Um, so, although the Bodhisattva path was seen early on as a very lofty goal, the idea of the laity being just as able to practice in this way were further supported with sutras such as the Bhimlakirti Sutra and the Sutra of Queen Shamala of the Lion's Roar, both of which focus on the lay person attaining awakening. This adoption of altruistic compassion for others leads us to a huge distinction the reliance on the bodhisattva path. There is so much to be said here. I'm not gonna get, I'm able to be able to get into it as much as I would love to. Um, again, generally, there was a move away from what was being seen at the time as selfish way to practice, um, only practicing for the sake of one's own awakening, the Arhat path, and was seen as like as being too narrow and sullied with subtle pride. Um, and as we'll see in the, in the next point, a new perspective of the Buddha was, was on the rise, one that was less about Shakyamuni Buddha himself and more about the Buddha-ness of Shakyamuni Buddha. Therefore, the trend was moving towards characteristics that we now label as foundational to the Bodhisattva path, that of compassionately helping all sentient beings, experiencing the profound wisdom to be cultivated, and realize the full complete Buddhahood being the culmination of the Bodhisattva path. As I alluded to, there was also a shift away from the historical figure of Shakyamuni Buddha towards the faith and veneration of Buddhahood itself. This became the basis for the Pure, Pure Land Sutras and other texts that provided a new visionary perspective on the Buddhist cosmology. These glorified, transcendent beings inspired awe, faith, and devotion. What might be said here is that there was more focus on the Buddha in pre mahayanas thought than there was on the Dharma, which was traditionally been the emphasis. So, however, not enough could be said about the writings going on at this time. The number of treatises, sutra, etc., <clears throat> that were all amassing and being collected and, and altered and compiled was immense. Many of what might be considered foundational Mahayana's writings were started to be compiled as early as the first century of the Common Era. There are arguments that the Avantasaka Sutra was written as early as 500 years after the time of Shakyamuni Buddha. It was also touted to be the first teaching he gave, but no one could understand it. And we'll talk about that when that month comes up um, <clears throat> in relation to the Hwakan school. But the point being is these new texts were growing while Mahayana was, and while East Asian Buddhism was just getting started. Peter Harvey writes in his Introduction to Buddhism, the Mahayana emerges into history as a loose confederation of groups, each associated with one or more of a number of new sutras. And he goes on to say, anyone accepting the new literature as genuine sutras, authoritative teachings of the Buddha, thereby belong to the new movement. This did not necessitate monks and nuns abandoning their old fraternities, as they continued to follow the monastic discipline the Vinaya, of the fraternities in which they had been ordained. He goes on, the new sutras were regarded as the second turning of the wheel, a deeper level of teaching than the early suttas, and with the Buddha's bodhisattva disciples portrayed as wiser than his arha disciples. Because of the liberating truth the sutras were seen to contain, there was said to be a huge amount of merit in copying them out and disseminating, reciting, expounding, understanding, practicing, and even ritually venerating them. Such claims suggest defensiveness on the part of the new small movement trying to establish itself. The Mahayana sutras were probably produced by a new breed of charismatic Dharma preachers who championed them. These monks and some lay people directed their preaching both within and beyond existing community, Buddhist communities, 
to win converts. This they did by extolling the virtues of perfect Buddhahood, so as to elicit a conversation, a, a conversion experience of profound psychological effect. This was the arising of the, of the thought of enlightenment, bodhicitta, the heartfelt aspiration to strive for full Buddhahood by means of the bodhisattva path, end quote. So this is what was being brought into China and, and continues to grow in China, Tibet, and beyond. This is what sets the groundwork for some of the dis discussions we'll be having in the months to come. Um, <clears throat> we will dive into these various topics with this general history as our backdrop. I started here because this new turning of the wheel sets the tone for what's to come and provides the main themes of change that the Buddha Dharma was going through. Themes like emptiness and shunyata described in, in the Prajnaparamita Sutras, interpenetration um, from the Avantamsaka Sutra, skillful means and, ek and ekayana in the Lotus Sutra, the Majjhimaka, uh, Yogacara, and Tathagatagarbha schools, practice-oriented schools like Chan or Zen, and doctrinally reliant schools like the Huahian, etc. The, the Mahayana movement may be characterized as an elaboration of the teachings, and nothing actually said from Shakyamuni Buddha. But to me, that feels like a misrepresentation. Mahayana Buddhism is a convenient label to an ever unfolding of the Buddha Dharma, which is a bit paradoxic because that in and of itself is considered a Mahayana viewpoint. And it, it's the whole thing about defining the word with the word. Anyway, so, but I felt like it all starts with the, with the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. And from the time of his Parinirvana, there have been interpretations of the Dharma given by many devotees. The following centuries were filled with commentaries, and those were composed together to form the Abhidharma, one of the thirds of the Pali Tirtaka, the Pali Canon. And the interpretations did not stop with that compendium. More and more interpretations from learning, doing, and experiencing, to say nothing of time, place, culture, all continuing to happen. This particular shift north, away from monasteries, with no living Buddha, traveling along the Silk Road, helped to shape different interpretations of the Dharma. Hopefully, I've provided enough foreshadowing to, to help you see how first Tiantai, then Tendai teachings, would be influenced by these early gradual changes. As we explore the discussions to come, I hope to shed more light on how this relates to Tendai. But suffice it to say that much of these early Mahayanist ideals can already be directly related to Tendai doctrine and are worthy of our study. So that's where I'll leave you um, with thoughts of what's to come. Um, thank you so much.